Thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be back giving grand rounds for the Department of Medicine. Um, I was fortunate enough to do this about five years ago when I was finishing my chief year and did a talk on the broader history of medical records. And today it's fun to be zooming in on a specific part of uh, health informatics. Uh, and as you'll find out here, a bit of a history lesson coming today as well. Uh, so with that, uh, we'll show you my slides here. And so of course have the disclosure slide here that you can reference afterwards if needed. And so just jumping into my talk, as we've already heard, the title of the talk I have for you today is What Do I Need to Know About Artificial Intelligence? I will spoil right up front that there's probably more to know than we can cover in about 45 or 50 minutes here, but uh, just covering objectives, these are the things I'm really hoping to cover today or that you will get out of this. So first off, we're going to spend some time talking about the history and growth of artificial intelligence, specifically as it applies to medicine, but also hitting some broader topics, really with the goal of helping you understand how these things work and then with that, how they don't work. Uh, the second thing I'd like to then get into there, again, is some of those technical components. I promise this won't be too painful, but I do want it, again, just to set the stage for what we mean when we to say some of the different things relating to artificial intelligence. And then finally, uh, just spending some time at the end of the, of the presentation discussing where we are right now, what are some of the limitations or vulnerabilities in the current state, and again, how those can relate to unintended consequences, especially as we think about how quickly this field is moving. So with that, the outline for this presentation, again, to hash this in a different way, we'll talk a little bit about just the history of computer science and particularly sort of the early origins of the artificial intelligence. We'll talk about how those interface with medicine and some of the exploits with computers and medicine, particularly with some of the early automated decision support systems that exist. And then we'll shift a little bit to talk more about what I'll kind of consider more of the modern or current era with uh, what we'll now call artificial intelligence, specifically focusing on the field of large language models and machine learning. And then of course, at the end discussion about what are some recent developments we've seen in the field and what the future might hold. But first, I do just like to always set a frame when doing any informatics talk about what exactly we're talking about when we say medical informatics. And really the basis of this is using data to do stuff. But more specifically for people listening here, I like to think about uh, this term that was coined about 20 years ago now called the fundamental theorem of informatics. Um, and basically what this is saying is not actually this, that we're using computers to supplant or be better than humans, but rather that we are looking to find systems that we can augment the human function to make it more effective with the assistance of technology, or in this case, a uh, cathode ray tube computer from the 1980s. Uh, so with that, I want to then frame things a little bit as we talk about artificial intelligence with some basic definitions that will help you sort of think about how we come at these things. So first off, there's this idea of data science, which you may have heard around, and many of you are probably listening work in this field of, of data science. And specifically, what I will simplify this to say is basically analyzing massive amounts of data. Within that, we'll draw another circle of artificial intelligence, which is basically which is going to be computers performing tasks that you might commonly have associated with intelligent beings previously. I would like to point out one thing here. This is a, a quote that, that comes up in artificial intelligence discussion. This is called Tesla's theorem. Tesla was a, a computer scientist in the 1970 or around there. He basically said, well, artificial intelligence is just what we call whatever hasn't been done yet. And the reason I make that point is that there's been this sort of shifting mark of what's considered artificial intelligence and what is just considered everyday life. So of course, Siri is a system of artificial intelligence that we may not really think about as revolutionary since we've been using it on our, on our iPhones for a decade now. But if you look back even further, it could be simply you know, having decision support checks or drawing um, in a table of data from uh, you know, medications being dispensed. Barcode medication is a great example of an artificial intelligence system to make sure you give the right med to the right patient. Allergy alerts. Um, even an, an alarm going off on a monitor at the bedside, we would consider that artificial intelligence. If the computer is recognizing that someone's O2 sat is dropping uh, or a bed alarm when a patient is getting out. Again, these are some things we kind of take for granted, but they all are basically systems that augment human cognition or help us to do, uh, take some of the load off of our, of our own, um, own brains. So getting a little bit more narrow than talking about machine learning. So this is something that again, focus a bit more on kind of specific use of computers to start to emulate human intelligence. And what you could say here basically is we're generating algorithms, we're generating systems that uh, 
uh, or a computer program can run or run a prediction on without actually explicitly programming in something. So it's one thing if we, you know, as a population health scientist, identify the seven parameters for risk factors that go into the ASCVD calculation, and we do that off of using statistics. It's another thing to just take a large data set and set a system to set a computer to it to figure out the patterns or find those things. And that's really where we're starting to get at with machine learning. A little bit more specifically within the field of machine learning, there's this idea of deep learning. And this is using specific tools to really now integrate big data or massive amounts of, of information to generate algorithms that you know maybe are not even fully understandable by a human. And so we'll come back to that in a little bit. And this is sort of, because this is sort of where generative AI lives when you start hearing that term. It's sort of an extension off of uh, concepts of deep learning. So we're gonna pivot now a little bit back to more of a broader history lesson. And you know, if we think about how much artificial intelligence has been discussed in the last 10 or so months, one might think this is a new concept, but of course I've been alluding to, this is far from it. In fact, uh, you know, artificial intelligence did not just become on a, a, a phrase that people use with the launch of ChatGPT in November of 2022. Uh, further, it's actually probably not going back to, um, you know, this artificial intelligence system with the Terminator, of course, the Skynet system, a massive surveillance state and, and the potential policing of humans through computers. Uh, you can go back even further. And of course, um, C-3PO is probably the most well-known original personal assistant, the original Siri, if you will, uh, providing language support for 120 translations or what it would, what it would have been. And um, of course, uh, other droids and things like that depicted in Star Wars. But let's roll the time back even another decade, of course, with the computer assistant in on the spaceship in 2001 Space Odyssey with HAL, which of course uh, proceeded to then uh, start to take over the ship and prevent the humans from controlling. Uh, but even back to the, really the origins, 1950s, when Isaac Asimov um, published iRobot, of course, with this sort of concept of the cyborg, cyborg and the humans that um, interface with and, and eventually, of course, you know, disrupt human society. Actually, the same year as iRobot was published was the year that Alan Turing published what's really kind of considered to be the foundational paper to think about how we approach artificial intelligence. And so it was, of course, this paper in uh, the journal Mind out of um, Oxford, and this uh, was a basically an essay about the idea of could machines ever learn to think? And that's sort of the first question here. I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And this really actually was what then later has become interpreted as the Turing test. And the Turing test simply is if one is interacting with a computer or a program and having a conversation with that program, would they be able to tell that it is in fact not a human? And so to be able to quote unquote pass the Turing test would be a human could not tell the difference. Around the same time, also, I like to just highlight the first actual official use of the term artificial intelligence or when it was coined. The origins of this are, of course, debated, but most would point to a summer gathering of computer scientists at Dartmouth uh, in 1956, where this paper came out that was sort of summarizing different uh, advances that were going on in computer science and, and coined this term artificial intelligence to, again, do what I sort of alluded to a few minutes ago of supporting or supplanting some human functions that would otherwise have been only, avail only able to be done by what we would consider an intelligence being. Um, and so that's sort of this idea of automatic computers or machines doing a job a human previously would as being that basis for artificial intelligence. Pivoting a few years, not too long after that, uh, medicine quickly starts to jump into the scene and recognizing potential applications for computers and medicine. And I'd like to point out this system that was uh, devised in the 1960s by Joseph Weizenbaum. It's called the ELISA system. And really this is often, often credited to be one of the first kind of chatterbots or natural language processing program. And what this system's intent was to do was basically to emulate an interaction between a patient and a psychotherapist. And I do this just by matching simple pattern, um, conversation patterns and uh, creating an output that actually seems pretty lifelike. So this is a, an excerpt or a screenshot of that original interface. And you can see this conversation here with the computer being Eliza speaking to a patient listed here as you. And so asking some of these reflective statements, like is something troubling you? Uh, Open-ended, Men are all alike. Well, what is the connection, do you suppose? They're always bugging us. Can you provide an example? Again, you see how this feels a bit like a 
psychotherapist. It's still pretty narrow in how it works, but again, within certain confines. Some people would even argue that this system just 10 years or so later would, or 15 years or so later, could pass the Turing test, at least with certain guardrails. I always like to look back also at some quotes that maybe don't age quite as well. And I, I found this paper from 1970 in the New England Journal by Dr. Schwartz. Um, and he, within this paper, talking about medicine and computers, is proposing that really with not, within not much time, it seems likely that computers will exert major effects, augmenting and in some cases, largely replacing the intellectual functions of the physician. So that was a, you know, a big prediction now over 50 years ago. And while yes, it's true, I think this has happened. Many, I think would argue that it hasn't happened nearly as much as we would have expected. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some attempts to get to there. And one of the first really foundational decision support systems for diagnostic and treatment was this system called Mycin. This was developed out of the University of Stanford by Edward Shortliffe. And what this function, what this system really served to function was uh, a, a way to suggest or identify a potential pathogen within an infectious disease presentation and then suggest an appropriate treatment from it. So drawing in information about a patient, comparing it against a uh, expert built knowledge base and then supporting decisions through that. Anyone who's in the field of informatics who's listening today will recognize the name. Of course, this is actually Edward Shortliffe, who's the chief editor of what's considered by many to be the foundational textbook of clinical informatics. And this was actually from his dissertation when he was a grad student at Stanford. So kind of an interesting piece of connection to the local history there too. Uh, Mycin was actually you know, pretty effective within limited confines. And building on that, a group of researchers out at the University of Pittsburgh devised this system called Internist One. And this was meant to be a more robust uh, computer-aided diagnostic system. They actually enlisted a bunch of med students to encode these extensive lists of disease findings, signs, symptoms, labs, all those things that would fit into different uh, patterns and made an aggressive goal to try to cover 70% or so of the common diagnoses that humanity would face. And it actually, again, was quite robust in its approach. However, it was quite clunky to work with and some estimates saying it could take as much as 90 minutes to work through a case entering in all of the necessary data to get uh, uh, a definitive answer out of it. Um, this was a paper just kind of talking about that and showing some of it how it works. I like this figure just to include for a second because it sort of gives you a bit of an idea of how the structure of this. It's fairly simple, simplified of kind of feeding in from questions to set up different hypotheses and then start ranking them as what's more likely, what's less likely and branching off questions about, about that. So we'll come, at, come back to this in a second. Uh, interesting in, in sort of its, again, growth and robustness and actually kind of was subsequently expanded on by this quick medical reference, which is sort of uh, a secondary system to support decision making. And again, in the 80s, I actually tried to commercialize that, but really didn't have much success with it, probably due to a number of limitations. But just now want to pause for a second to check in as we sort of pull ourselves from the early eras of computer science to um, some of this enthusiastic growth through a couple decades. And so can just ask a question if computers have been integrated into medicine for over 60 years and we've seen such growth in this in so many other sectors, why does it feel like there's still been relatively little progress in medicine? And I think there's actually a lot of explanations for this. Probably one of the most actually pressing, pressing ones is there's this idea of funding winters that have happened through the development of artificial intelligence systems in medicine. And what I mean by that basically is just that there's a lot of excitement and then it becomes clear how difficult it is and people really sort of pull resources from it. So it's not that there maybe wasn't potential, but it's just to quote a, a tool Gawande medicine can be hard. Uh, medicine is complex. And actually the second part to this is just gets back to sort of the systems just being kind of cumbersome. And so along with just data entry, even just the computing capacity to run some of the more complex algorithms that would be effective really were pretty limited. And with that also then, just to make meaningful predictions or meaningful diagnoses, this isn't a large enough knowledge base and really even the storage capacity to really get this to the fidelity necessary. Uh, back to the AI winters thing, I do also just like to point out this uh, commonly referenced idea, which is called the Gartner hype cycle. And you see this applied to all kinds of different technological advances. And basically, it's this natural curve where there's some sort of disruptive technology that becomes more present in the public view, which leads to this huge amount of visibility. And with that, really 
inflated expectations, called the peak of inflated expectations here on the first spot on the curve. Then, of course, as people try to actually apply this or see the value in it, there's a lot of sort of disillusionment that comes in the second trough here where you maybe wonder, is this really going to amount to as much as they promised? And then the second wave of innovation comes through where we actually start to see real practical applications, the slope of enlightenment, as it's called here, until we sit sort of a steady state, which ends up being somewhere between those initial expectations and whatever the state was prior to the prior to the emergence of that technology. And so I think we see that hype cycle repeat itself regularly through the 60s, 70s, 80s in medicine. And without going into too many details, you sort of see big claims uh, that don't really work out as much. And um, I'm sure people can even think of some examples of that more recently, things like IBM Watson, which I'll again talk about in a second. But things do change. And so this is really, we do start to see things kind of start to reshape as we get it from from the 90s where it's sort of been a funding winter into the 2000s. And one of the biggest drivers to this, I think, is really can't understate the just massive amount of growth in computing power. So the second point to this is that available data also has really grown dramatically over this time. And this is largely driven by the digitization of health records. So again, referencing back to my last talk on this one, I really talked more about how electronic health records have become ubiquitous. There was a lot of pressure, and this is specifically looking at the United States, to adopt electronic health records with legislation in the 2000s. And so the impact of that, the um, now referred to as High Tech Act, uh, part of the um, reinvestment bailout plan of 2008 around the crash, all of that set the stage for moving all of those records and paper into digital forms, which then are computer readable and processable. So over the course of a few years, basically almost every health system in uh, in the country now has some form of electronic health record, some sort of digitization of the data, which can then be fed into a computer with, with its ever-growing processing power. And the last point here is just to talk about growth in algorithms. And I'm not going to get too far into the weeds this. I'll disclose I am not a computer scientist. Um, I have a bit of an engineering background, but never spent my time doing any hard coding, never spent my time developing these algorithms. So, so we'll scrape just the surface on this, but I do want you to understand a few of these terms. And the first is this concept of a neural network. Again, not actually that new of an idea, first proposed in the 50s by Frank Rosenblatt, um, then called a perceptron, which was sort of an idea of developing algorithms or information storage to mimic how a brain works, which is to say, if you imagine a, a simple neuron in the brain, it has synapses or connections to sometimes hundreds of other nerves or neurons, and all of those different synapses, when functioning together, change how that neuron then produces its output. So drawn here in a simplified way, you can see this input having impact on what is referred to as sort of the hidden layer and different inputs leading to different weighting to produce different outputs. So if you think about it kind of from a prediction model, you can sort of have different influences on output with a way that, again, might be not truly human interpretable because you could never really understand how all of these different inputs are impact, impacting outputs. Um, and supervised learning is this idea that fits within this also, which is basically you have a fixed set of data that you know the inputs and you know the outcomes, and then you feed that into a larger data set to help a computer uh, identify other assumptions and make better predictions. A great example of this is this toy that I'm showing here, which is, I hope um, many of you have, have had a chance to play with in the past. It's the 20 questions toy. Unfortunately, it hasn't been produced for about, 20, for about 10 years, but you can still do the web version of it if you go to 20q.net. And so this actually does have an integrated neural network that was developed from crowdsourcing in the late 80s through the 90s. And effectively what happens with this, if, if you're not familiar with this toy, is through a series of asking 20 questions that are yes or no, the algorithm can predict with a kind of arresting accuracy what item you're thinking of. It gets to basically the two to the 20th factorial. Um, if you take 20 questions and each one of those has a branching possibilities of 50% of things will fit into cats into bucket A and 50% will fit into bucket B. If you ask the right questions, you could get to a million different things, which is more than likely to capture most of the things that people will think about. So what's happening when every time someone does this and says, yes, you were right, or no, you were wrong, I was actually thinking of blank, that neural network is reinforcing certain pathways and adding more weight to certain 
yes, no responses and less to others, and then redirecting how it will answer questions to get to that sort of 50-50 yes, no grouping to narrow down to this tree. Again, an oversimplification of it, but neural networks that are often passed around as this cutting edge thing that is transforming any piece of technology from an iPhone to a computer algorithm has actually been ingrained in some pretty simple and cheap things for 20 or 30 years. So that, that said, I don't want to minimize progress that has been made, which again gets to this deep learning process, which basically adding that computing power and adding some new growth in different algorithms, the predictions or the ability to associate models gets, gets more and more sophisticated effectively by adding in these different layers. So again, outputs going in that affect another layer, which then affects another and so on. And so this allows to take on some of these more sophisticated prediction tools rather than just a yes, no question, but now taking every pixel within an image and figuring out how those relate to each other. Or maybe it's a sequential data or large population um, numerical inputs or even unstructured data as it relates to language, which is, of course, where the talk I promised we would get to. I'm not going to go into all of the different places that there's been changes in artificial intelligence and how these deep neural networks have influenced different fields in medicine. But I think the ECG is a good example to walk through to, again, think about some of the early technologies, the shifting to what we use now to what we might use in the future. And so, of course, ECGs have had a computer output prediction of what's going on for decades. Actually, the first computer-aided diagnostics in this field were developed in the 60s and made commercially available in the 80s. And the way those ones work, and the way the ones work on most of the machines we use today in the hospital, is they just simply look at the signal in and try to extract features, like intervals and amplitudes and waveforms, and then match those to pre-programmed patterns. And so the patterns and the the features that exist there are all hard-coded by a cardiologist or a team of cardiologists. I always love to elevate um, UW's work whenever there's something like this. In this case, I've got to give a nod to our across the state um, university. Marquette was actually really the, the um, university that um, scientists there really pi pioneered this working closely with GE, developing some of these alg algorithms. So the Marquette system is often referenced with the EKGs. Um, that said though, this system, still relies on expert knowledge and it still relies on being able to accurately extract those features into the discrete things that then get matched to the database and they're still subject to all the clinical guidance and so that is why you know we often tell the med students to flip the top down not only because of the learning thing they got to learn to do this on their own but also because it gets it wrong a fair bit uh, because the pattern matching the the processes that were used are just not that sophisticated well, of course this is an AI talk, so there is, of course, growth in this, and there has actually been a lot of work in applying some of these deep learning principles to recognize these patterns. And so here's just one example of this that I pulled out of um, uh, an article in Nature that looked at a deep, deep neural network that researchers developed to interpret ECGs and tried to compare it with how cardiologists interpret ECGs. And so the point with any sort of prediction model like this is you're no longer looking at just a simple test positivity. You're thinking about the receiver operating curves. And so not getting too far into that, what this is drawing here is showing the, the receiver operating curve of how sensitive you set it to be compared to a panel of individual cardiologists. And then also the green dot is showing sort of how the average cardiologist would function on this as sort of a, um, a conglomeration of both of these. Put another way, uh, with this data table from this paper, I'm just showing here that if you pick the specificity on an on the deep neural network algorithm to match that of what an expert consensus of cardiologists would be for specificity, and then you set your curve to that, the average sensitivity of the algorithm is more effective at catching a lot of these rhythms than just, as, just the average cardiologist. I'm not saying that the computers are coming for your job, cardiologists. It's just interesting to see how, how there is this application that it can support some of those um, findings. But there is then the extension to this, to the things that really, I do think, start to get people's minds to start spinning. So this was a paper that came out earlier this year, which the goal of the researchers, what they wanted to do with this was they were just going to feed a bunch of ECGs into their algorithm to try to understand how old a patient was. But they were finding that the patients were actually, the output from the algorithm was saying they were older than they actually were. When they went back and looked at outcomes, 
they found that the people that had the age higher than their chronologic age, so their ECG predicted age higher than the chronologic age, had a higher incidence of, of uh, cardiovascular disease and all actually all major cardiovascular events. So um, effectively what this algorithm is doing is just taking a simple ECG tracing can have no perceptible abnormalities to the human eye and predicting cardiovascular risk from it. It's a new study, it's, it's, but it's an idea where you can see that there's a potential new way to have a risk factor from something that's not human interpretable. It's all simply coming from this, this system to recognize subtle changes uh, to infer risk. And there are many other applications of this. And again, I could have given a talk on any one of these points and covered more than an hour of it. But um, researchers on this campus, um, Dr. Afshar, who talked last year, doing a lot of great work in clinical prediction models. Um, there are all of these different computer-aided diagnostics beyond just ECG. So lots of, there's a whole story of radiology and systems being proposed to work better than a radiologist and then failing miserably and leading into actually, I think some small AI winters there because there is this hesitancy to embrace when the previous applications got it so wrong. Interestingly, retinography for diabetes is an area where there is a, um, an FDA approved device on the market that can take a full field picture of the retina, put it into the algorithm and recognize retinography without retinopathy, without um, any ophthalmologist input. Similarly, dermatoscopy has been shown to be really effective at this, just taking a skin picture um, can often do pretty well at detecting different uh, carcinomas. The whole field of biochemistry has, of course, seen a lot of impact on this already, and there's a lot of enthusiasm there, a completely different branch of just thinking about protein folding and thinking about how genetics play into um, pathology of disease to develop new biochemistry applications or discover new drugs. The next two points are things that we are using day to day, again, getting to that sort of, we take for granted what would have been, been really um, revolutionary even a few years ago. So optical character recognition is actively happening right now in our system. When scans go in, it helps categorize what those documents are. And then, of course, I hope most of the clinicians here have used or are using some speech-to-text uh, transcription. So, of course, our M-modal system, um, very effective at just taking spoken word to translate that into um, dictated uh, speech. The, the, the area of the future of that, of course, is ambient listening, too, which I'll come back to in a second. Now talk about more recent artificial intelligence and, and uh, deep learning and medicine is complete without at least spending a second talking about IBM Watson, because again, this is one of those kind of big failures that almost could have pushed us into another funding winter, I propose. Um, but of course, IBM Watson was the system that was effectively doing language processing to understand questions. And famously, when it was first released, it went on to Jeopardy just shortly thereafter and beat the pants off of two of the best Jeopardy players uh, in the game. And shortly after that, then of course, all these other applications start springing up that again, Watson is as smart as a second year med student. It's doing better at cancer and di at diagnosing cancer than doctors can. Um, we're gonna analyze massive data to understand how uh, all kinds of things are happening in medicine and uh, be able to diagnose rare diseases, such as uh, this article about uh, leukemia diagnosis that doctors just couldn't crack. Um, generating treatment plans and identifying what's gonna be the best thing. So all of this enthusiasm over the decade of the 2010s. But then suddenly IBM is kind of starting to question, well, how do we make money on this? And they just can't find a viable solution to it and they sell it all off a year ago, effectively dismantling the entire um, health, health arm of IBM. And so there's sort of this discussion about, well, geez, what happened there? <laughs> Um, and, and it gets to that idea that, that keeps coming back with these applications that it is hard to do this and it's hard to do it well and generate a return on investment. So what's, why now, why am I here today talking about this? What's different? And of course, this is the elephant in the room, which is the idea of large language models and specifically chat GPT being the thing that has driven a lot of this. So let's define that a little bit. Let's pull it back again. I'm going to keep giving you history lessons. I'm sorry I'm torturing people in here. Um, but I, I think it's just so important to understand where we came from to, to, to know where we are now and where we may be headed. Again, language models had their origin in the 60s. I mentioned Eliza earlier that does this sort of rule-based text matching. And some of those algorithmic changes or statistical models do really start to develop in the 90s, not so much in medicine, but um, early speech recognition, you start to have that sort of ability to take recorded voice and turn it into text. 
uh, language translation was one of those things that, um, you know, I think gave uh, foreign language teachers a lot of headaches in the 90s as, as things like Babelfish came on board, which again, used pattern matching to convert to different languages. The big change, however, that has happened in this field is this idea of transformers. So transformer architecture was, was there was a paper published in 2017 that described this, that basically it uses these deep learning techniques to develop attention or a computer algorithm can basically decide within a sentence or within a block of text can decide what features of that text are more important and weight those more heavily. Again, an oversimplification, I, um, but, but it does really change how this language processing fits from just simple pattern matching to matching to the things that have the most relevance or most importance. And so that transformer word, you may recognize this if you've ever kind of questioned what GPT actually stands for. It stands for generative pre-trained transformer. And I actually want to define that because I think it gives at least enough of an idea of what's happening behind the scenes of these systems. So the transformer part I talked about already effectively is this efficient, effective understanding of language or focusing on relevant parts of the text. The pre-trained part is also somewhat, somewhat um, self-explanatory, but it gets to that idea that I said earlier that the data inputs that these models are trained on, the stuff you're feeding into it to make those other predictions has grown really big. And then the generative part of it is this now sort of the buzzword, the generative AI, which is to produce new text that follows those patterns. So the transformer algorithm learns how to make things fit or understandable with the right importance, and then uses those patterns to generate new outputs that feel like human spoken word or feels like a limerick or feels like a pirate talking or whatever those applications are that, that have all the memes on the internet about it. I want to talk about the growth of these training models because this really is the biggest change. It's just how much data these algorithms have processed. And so to do this, I'm going to illustrate something here. And I want you to imagine training as reading a book. And one book contains, we'll call them tokens. It's oversimplification to simplify that to words. But tokens basically are these kind of specific training items that could be as part of a word, a word, a string of words. One token equals one word for this simplicity. And one book is 100,000 tokens. And one library, oops, um, one library shelf is 100 books. So the first transformer uh, that was published in that paper in 2017 was just tasked with uh, serving as a translation from English to German. They fed in about 4.5 million sentence pairs, quoted at 100 million tokens, which would look like 10 library shelves drawn here. GPT-1 from OpenAI came out about a year after that or 18 months after that, and they expanded their data set to make it more effective at predictions, fed in 7,000 books, quoted at about 4.5 gigabytes of data. What that looks like is about 60 bookshelves are drawn out here, a field of bookshelves, already a massive growth over the first transformer, uh, about six times as large. GPT-2, well, that's about the equivalence of almost 3,000 bookshelves. So they set in a bunch of just free text had it read over 8 million documents, a ton of web pages from Reddit, large chunks of uh, Wikipedia fed into this. And what that looks like here drawn out is, of course, a field of bookshelves, the growth of this, just GPT-2, not even what we're talking about yet, having tons of information fed into it, all of that feeding in to support prediction making. GPT-3, that's what you are typically interacting with, or 3.5, but not to split hairs there when you're going on to open AI right now and entering in things to it. And so that, um, the, the published amount of that is about a half a terabyte of text, including large swaths of the internet, all of Wikipedia, and a huge set of just published books that are available through a digitization of reading um, through this, these kind of corpora or collections of books. And so what that looks like is, of course, a huge change of this field of books. Um, I'll step over not to be completely focused on Microsoft. So Google has their own algorithms that are growing out here, and they have one that was Palm. There's Palm 2 now, which I don't even have here, but Palm actually was tons of Wikipedia, a bunch of source code, threw in a bunch of Twitter, news articles, all these other things, basically doubling the data set. And then, of course, GPT-4 hasn't ever been published publicly disclosed how much is in that, but there have been some sort of words that have come out from people in there and some estimations of it. But effectively, this quote of 13 trillion tokens, this huge field of library books, if you can imagine it that way, all of those things feeding into the predictions that it is making when it spits out text to you that feels like you're talking to a human that knows everything about everything in the world. 
This is only possible because of things like Moore's law. So remember, I talked about that exponential growth, that doubling of computing power, how it just continues to go and go and go. This takes a ton of resources. And I mentioned there that our personal computers, the processors stopped growing at this rate years ago. Um, if you took it and tried to process all the data that's in GPT-4, it would take 7 million years for it to complete the training is, is one estimate that we have here. So these supercomputers that they're processing these are, are just that these are processing at, are just functioning at ways that it almost defies um, comprehension to me. So at this point, there are probably a few of you who might be saying, well, I, I still don't know what a language model is. Tell me what this actually is because I don't understand it. So here's my oversimplified definition of what a large language model is. It is basically a piece of software that does a ton of math to predict the next word in a sentence. That's really all it's doing is it's just saying, because of everything I know, and because of the word that is here, this is the next word that should come. And it can do that math incredibly fast, and it can do it over tons and tons and tons of, of different formulas that it has learned to be able to do this incredibly well. So really, that's at the end of it, it's not understanding, it's not thinking, it's simply processing math based off of patterns that it has learned after digesting every word that humans have ever written. Not quite that, but it sure is feeling like it's getting close to that at this point. So to recap what we've been talking about up to this point, we have this seemingly endless data. We have seemingly endless computing power, at least sort of. And with that, we have these language models that are coming out and in some cases actually striking fear in the masses and how powerful they are. Sam Altman here, the CEO of OpenAI has publicly stated he regrets doing this. He's worried about what kind of dystopian things this could lead to. Um, but we'll leave that all behind and just talk about what, what does this mean for medicine? Why aren't we using this already? There are a few big limitations to this. And I wanna just spend a second to help again, temper what is going on here so that you can make good decisions about how to use this or how to interpret it. And so again, it gets back to this idea that these algorithms don't think but the outputs that they can put out can be wrong. This is actually referred to colloquially now as hallucinations. So the output that comes out of it, it is told with confidence and it seems real, but it is completely off and made up. Um, and that is due to a number of different things. The first is that it's only good as good as the data that these things are trained on. So there's bias within the data sets that's fed into this. Even if you consider the human existence, we are biased humans. And so there will be emphasis on certain things that are not accurate. When we talk about even some things through you know, our more simple risk prediction, like the Framingham risk score really has uh, a tilt to um, you know, oversample uh, or not sample minority subgroups enough. So it undervalues that. And other areas here too, we're just simply, we don't have the data on some things because of disparities. The second thing here is that these algorithms are actually subject to small changes. And that's getting better as the data has grown, but this is one I love to show. This is from a few years ago, so I'll acknowledge that the algorithms have gotten a lot better. But there's this idea of adversarial assault on algorithms, which is basically you change a little bit of the input and suddenly everything goes wrong. So in this paper, what they had was a system that was really uh, targeted to do image recognition. And in the original system um, here on the right, it's got it's really good at, at them identifying this European fire salamander. But the researchers then go in and change just a few pixels, three or four pixels within the picture, and suddenly it gets it completely wrong and says that this is a picture of guacamole. It's a comically a comical error, and of course, it these subtle influences do I think really start to kind of degrade some of the trust in the system. Um, this is actually happening, and we're seeing this still with the GPT systems. At least it seems like it. So this is a preprint paper. So I acknowledge it has not been published, um, but I, I couldn't help but share it because I just thought it was fascinating. Um, researchers out at Stanford and Berkeley were trying to look at feeding the same input into these language models and seeing what happens over time and if it changes. And they're reporting some pretty dramatic changes here. So one thing that, that the language models are notoriously bad at is doing math because they are dealing with words, not numbers. But GPT-4 in the upper right, you know, pretty good at finding prime numbers initially and kind of way worse at it. But the things that we should care about, you know, there was a lot of splash about um, the USMLE exam and how great GPT was at this. And even GPT-4 got worse at it over three months from March to June. I don't have an explanation for this. I'm, I'm sure there's probably going to be a lot of vetting to this and try to understand it. So there's certainly more to come in it, but the basic part of it is just that these algorithms change. The input that you put in today might not be get the same output tomorrow as it did today, which is a problem, right? If we're going to rely on this for clinical applications. And so with that, there's this idea of the black box problem, which is basically 
these systems can do incredible things, but we don't know how they do it. So with that, when they get it wrong, it makes it hard to fix. Because if you don't know how they got there, how can you change the system to get it better, short of just feeding it tons more data? But for users, the issue there is, if I don't know how it got there, how can I know it's correct? How can I trust it? So you know, even if this gets it right, a thousand, you know, 99, 999 times out of a thousand, that one time it's wrong is going to degrade that trust, and and that's going to be an issue. The next top couple limitations, just a cite on here. So first off is just this idea that if it's giving medical device medical advice, it's probably considered a medical device. And this is actually in statute. So um, the FDA has for a few years now been regulating different clinical decision supports. And um, to the people who work in this space, it's been a big challenge to figure out, well, does my algorithm for predicting clinical decompensation, is that is that decision support? Does it need to go through a thorough FDA regulation or is it just a tool in the health record? Um, there's actually a proposal out right now about how these AI machine learned type things are regulated by the FDA. So there's certainly more to come on this. And that's all I'm going to spend on that for today. But the last thing just that has to be talked about is the cost of these things. So it's still just really unclear how much these things are actually going to cost to implement. Um, Sam Altman, again, CEO of OpenAI, has said it costs over $100 million to train GPT-4. And then running those servers every day to process those models probably costs hundreds of dollars, hundreds of thousands, millions. Nobody quite knows, but it surely is expensive. So how do we demonstrate the return on investment? What are the applications that are actually going to be useful or do things better in such a way that it justifies spending what's going to be a ton of money on this? So we've already talked about some of these different things um, with computer aided diagnostics. Um, and then I talked about language models. So there are a few things that we definitely can expect. And I want to just put, spend one slide on some things that definitely are in the pipe. These are things that Epic has publicly advertised that they are developing. The first box there is just generating medical advice replies. I'm sure many of you are aware that UW is a pilot on this. I'm one of the pilot members specifically. I'm not going to go into my experiences on it, but I will tell you that it's, you know, there's a there is a alpha test in process. So the thought that this could be impacting broad clinical practice soon is very um, plausible. Other things they've talked about that I think would be great applications, like just helping with translations. It does this incredibly well. Or even lowering the reading level on a patient instruction list from what's written in medical jargon to something interpretable by an eighth grader. Similarly, taking a massive radiology report and summarizing that into something digestible for patients. The fourth box down here, this one feels closer than ever, and it's been a promise for years, which is this idea that we could record an entire medical conversation with the provider and a, and a patient, and then distill that into a succinct, accurate, and referenceable clinic note. If this is realized, if this is implemented effectively, it can be a total game changer for how we practice medicine, because suddenly my hands are no longer on the keyboard, either during the visit or for three hours at night. Now I'm back to just working with the patient while the data is being captured and summarized in a simple way. Similarly, taking all of that and then boiling it into bigger sets of data for what happened since the last visit or an overview on a patient and just give me, tell me you know, what I need to know about them. So some big pro prospects there. Also from the business case, again, trying to develop return on investment, helping us develop the right code to pick those out without having an army of coders sitting in another room reading all our notes and picking data out. This might do a lot better at that. So, Last, I do just want to talk about what's the policy at UW Health, since you can go tomorrow and punch things into OpenAI and, and get outputs and use those in your practice. It is possible. Some organizations have said, nope, we're putting a total firewall against that. Do not use it. You're not allowed to use that. UW has been a little bit more lax, which is basically to say that you are a clinician and you are responsible for anything that you deliver to a patient or affect care. And so you need to verify that output of a language model. Um, along with that, you can't put PHI in this. Hard stop. Anything that's leaving our system cannot go into that. So again, you cannot copy a big note and feed it into OpenAI. That is a breach of PHI, so don't do it. But you could, in generic terms, say, I'm taking care of a patient with blank, 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 blank. Tell me about, write a letter to the insurance company. That kind of stuff. With great power comes great responsibility, right? So that's what I'm going to say on that. There are, I'm sure, more questions on it. But um, I do just, you know, again, just to kind of recap what we've talked about here. So we've covered computers and medicine, we've talked about AI, we've talked about how we got here and some of the current state and a little bit of the future. But again, nobody really knows what medicine will look like in five years. We've never known what medicine will look like in five years. And it's no different today, but undoubtedly there will be influences on this. There will be changes. 
Um, what I will say, my, my only prediction I will make is I would expect these changes to be small and incremental rather than massive shifts. And that just gets to the fact that we've got to get this right. We can't be, you know, we are not like Silicon Valley. We can't go fast and break things. Um, and so finding small areas where this really works, it generates value and then expanding from there is going to be the way to be successful at this. Um, and so that, of course, still leaves a lot of things open. And I have a few minutes for questions. I, I see a few rolling in. Um, I think Dr. Trowbridge is going to help me moderate this, um, but we'll leave it for that. So again, for the question portion, if you'll enter, enter these into the Q&A section, um, we'll then read them back and um, try to give some, I'll try to give my best take on these. Okay, so uh, first I'm going to ask this question from um, Andrea Picknis. For algorithms, AI, ML, um, any, how is UW clinically validating them to ensure the work is intended for fit purpose patient populations and that they don't cause harm disparities? So the first question, thank you, Andrew, for that. It's a great question because it gets to that point about how these things can get it wrong or they can perpetuate biases or, or reinforce disparities. And so that is the task of that um, AI committee that I had up a second ago. So that's a committee that's, that's composed of clinicians, it's composed of analysts, computer scientists, and we have representation from PFAC and from DEI on that. So again, having this broad lens about that. And that's specifically looking at directed algorithms to clinical prediction scores and things like that. To the large language models, again, it gets to the point that, and this is something Epic has said too, nothing will ever be generated that goes directly to a patient. There always needs to be a clinician validating it to say, this makes sense. Yes, I agree with this. And then moving it forward. And in most cases, again, limiting my, my experiences with the my, my short messages, massaging it a bit to make it more appropriate. Okay, I actually a question before this, uh, uh, Peter, is in the 70s, I heard, why should I learn to detect heart murmurs? I can always get an echo. The AI extension of this is to discourage trainees from applying themselves to learning clinical decision-making skills. What are the dangers of AI in the practice of medicine? That's a great question. And, and I, I think about this one a lot, especially if just like, if you think about even, I talked about how excited I am about ambient listening and having it write our notes for us. The act of writing a progress note is an academic and it is a clinical act because you're organizing your thoughts, you are recollecting them, synthesizing them, and putting it into a different form. We have to change how we do documentation. We have to relieve people from this work, but we also need to think about how do we replicate that process in a different way that is full to the clinical, clinical practice and especially to learners, right? You know, it's some of it is spending that time writing those notes. So again, it gets to the idea of judiciously applying this, I think is the key. And, and not letting those skills atrophy alongside it. And that's gonna take a conscious effort by each of us individually and also system-wide. System okay, hey, uh, then assuming AI is here to stay, what risk does AI pose for patient confidentiality? So, so patient confidentiality comes up a lot in this. And specifically, if we think about just applications of using GPT, I will re add a reassurance that anything that you have going through the record that feeds into GPT, so again, from HealthLink or from Epic, that is all HIPAA protected through a channel that is appropriately um, gated. That said, there is this other question about what is feeding into those language models to form this? Um, and that comes up a lot of, especially as you start to see healthcare startups trying to get into the space and they want to use a Tyler Daler data set that's fed into it, but have to make sure it's scrubbed of, of PHI, which is a big task. So, so yeah, I think, I think there are big questions there and definitely risks that need to be mitigated. And again, it gets to why we need to be careful. Uh, another question, we have a few more minutes, Peter. What information sources do AI tools use for training in medicine and how do they navigate privacy and how are they updated with new knowledge or drop outdated information? I love that question because it's it's a it's a one that there's probably a, a number of answers to. You know, if we look at just the big ones on the scene right now, the GPTs and the Palm, Bard, Google, all of those, they're really fed off of a large, just complete data set. So they're reading the internet. Um, but there have been these proposals of, well, we need to be proactive about those bias issues, about those those challenges and feed in a more select data set. So there are, and I've, I've heard of a couple of different smaller company startups that have been saying, well, we've got the corpus of data that's going to be drive all decision making and we'll use the language skills from the large model to, to generate the things that feel real and feel human, but 
will only direct this decision off of this more limited set. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a great approach. We'll see if it works. That's, that's kind of the point of it. And here is like, what do you know about the future? Can you discuss unexpected emergent abilities of LLM and whether you foresee this being good or bad for AI in medicine? Yes. So, so my favorite example of this is it's one that I, I know I got a lot of TikToks early on is the the idea of well I'm just going to use ChatGPT to write a denial letter to write a, write an appeal letter to the insurance company. But what happens if on the other end of that, the insurance company is also using the same GPT to write their denial letter? And suddenly now we just have AI systems talking back and forth to each other. And, and so it's so it's it's very much, I think, just that, that simplest thing. Can, you can see how this can definitely go wrong. Um, the you know, but but there are, of course, other things, too, here where what if it does get it wrong? What if patients that just take this to the next level of Dr. Google, which we already face, and now they're saying, well, but GPT's so good, it's better than my doctor, because my doctor's using it, because they heard on the news that UW Health is sending messages to my chart. So I'm just going to send the message and rely on that input, which, you know, might not be the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, so so there's, there's a lot of places that you can see these questions or these flags right, um, raising up. Uh, and, and then I think uh, another question, in your experience, is there a current LLM that you think is most effective, GPT Jet 4, Claude, Llama? Good question. Um, I, I, I don't want to put my chips down on anyone. I will say that at various points in this discussion, I would draw on a couple of the large language models just to see what it would put out. Give me, an, a, give me some, some uh, suggestions. I had a few slides I had to pull out because I didn't have time for it. But um, in that experience at the time, I found GPT to be more effective than, than the other ones. But um, but again, it's a, it's a quickly changing field and everyone is in an arms race to make the better model. So yeah, what's true today is probably not true in a week. Uh, Catherine, are there any more questions? I don't see any more. Yes, I just put another one in the chat. Okay, and this will be our closing one. Um, in a more positive light, how do you see AI's role in rural healthcare? That's a good question. I actually was talking to a group of the FQHCs a few weeks ago about this very thing. And I think there's a lot of process, promise. Um, it, battling the cost issue, potentials for efficiencies, for being able to manage a larger panel of patients, perhaps, because you can use some of this tool to triage out, or you can use it to sort of again, um, make things more efficient. That's that's what a lot of them are interested in because they have these challenges to, to care for the large populations. So, so again, if we're talking about not replacing but augmenting clinician abilities, there is an opportunity to be more efficient and be more effective and reach more people um, if we get it right. That's always gonna be the asterisk is if we do it the right way. Um, and so, it's, so we all need to kind of take a step, pause, Calm down and and again think about this in a careful way and and make these steps as we can. Um, carefully. Well, yeah. Dr. Kleinter, thank you. Um, this has been really enlightening and I think super intense grand rounds and so a lot to think about and really appreciate um, all the work you've done already and are doing for us in the future. So thank you very much. All right, take care, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Thank y'all for listening. Bye.